this 26th Dynaflow lecture. And we are very happy that we found uh, Tony Paul in, uh, available to present today's uh, Dynaflow lecture. For those of you who don't know exactly the background of Tony Paul, Tony Paul is the author of uh, CSR2 and presently he is the owner and inspirer of the Paul and Richards group. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Aunt. Are you the inspirer of <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Okay, today's uh, topic is a new primary sustain and occasional load allowables for piping systems. Essentially what happened is for the last seven years we were working on stress, intens stress intensification factors for the piping code. So with the stress intensification factor modifications, the sustained stress allowable, the way it's set up in the code, has the I factor in it. So with new stress intensification factors, the question came up is can we continue to do the sustained stress analysis the same way we've been doing with the old I factors? So since you've got a whole new set of I factors, can we continue uh, performing the sustained and occasional stress analysis the same way? So the, the answer was is no, you really can't. But we needed to go out and define the sustained and occasional stress analysis to be able to make that prediction. So that's what this discussion is about, is that path uh, in, in an attempt to define whether 0.75i could be used. To uh, start the story, we have to start with the changing in the I factors. So the changing in the I factors for the code began in 1987 with WRC 329, and that was Ev ball. Originally, they thought that there was a problem with the D over D ratio, and that the error in the stress intensification factors was about two times. So when Ev did the review of the existing state of stress intensification factors, he first did more tests on a machine that we have in Houston today. They sent it to Oklahoma, did the tests in Oklahoma, then sent it back to Houston. But he ran this other set of tests or additional sets of tests and said that yes, there is a, an error in the stress intensification factors in the B313 code. The magnitude of that error is two, but that's small compared to all the other errors in the code. So at that time he went through and he said these are the things that need to be done to the section two and section three or uh, class two and class three nuclear code section three and to all the B31 codes. Here are the changes that need to be made where two was a small number. The uh, nuclear code picked up those changes within the next five years. So the nuclear code changed and accepted Ev's recommendations. The B31 code hasn't changed yet. And so in 2007 when they uh, altered their research procedure. Originally, ASME was doing research with the Welding Research Council, these fellows. In the 2007, they started their own company to do research. So it was the STLLC projects, or the STLLC companies. So we were the second research project that the ASME uh, uh, provided or, uh, or uh, gave money for. And that project was to align the stress intensification factor. So anyway, so, uh, so this, this is what's going on. Uh, the project that we had in following up what was done with WRC 329 was STP PT 073. So this is the document that will be available on the ASME website this month. So it's available for sale. It's about 500 uh, pages of, of document. It uh, continues or contains everything that Ev did in WRC 329 plus everything that we did since WRC 329 was written. The Electric Power Research Institute uh, did a lot of research work. A lot of it was uh, private up until 2007. When we started the project in 2007, they agreed to make a certain amount of it public. So there's a lot of EPRI data now that's available to anybody that wants to log into the EPRI websites and download it. So all the EPRI data, additional work that we did, and all that Ev did is now compiled in STP PT 073 with an additional set of I-factor equations. Yeah. <clears throat> News and announcements from ASME, it's about ready. So sometime in November you should be able to download it and buy it. So that's the research work. So the research is in STP PT 073. The manifestation in the code will come through B31J. So B31J prior to two years ago was the stress intensification factor test document. All that it did was describe determination of stress intensification factors by test. Two years ago, they changed the scope of that document to include the new stress intensification factor equations 
and stress intensity factors for B31, the I factors, which is the sustained stress indices, which is what we're going to talk about today, and the flexibility factors, because flexibility factors were never determined very effectively. And one of the things that we did in 0702 and in the STP PT 073 project was determine the flexibility factors at branch connections could have a very significant impact on piping systems, particularly with large D over T's. Most of the work done before was in small D over T branch connections or four small D over T branch connections for the nuclear industry where pressure was high and temperature was high, so the wall thickness was thick compared to the diameter of the pipe. For the petrochemical industry, for chip making, for breweries, for pulp and paper, the D over T gets larger and the test data sets that we had for power weren't applicable. So flexibility factors became a, a bigger deal as we have larger D over T pipes. So since uh, the uh, 0702 and STPPT projects have been released, people have been reading those and writing papers about them. So David Kreitz has started writing papers about the new alignment of stress intensification factors. So you can go to a lot of the PVP conferences and see papers written on the sets of equations and the topics. The sustained stress indices, because they've never been defined before for B31, they were in Markle's work, 0.75i was used, but there was never a definition for them before. So this year in the PVP conference in California, we released this paper, Sustained Stress Indices, in the B31 2010 edition. So this is the first place where you actually see definitions of what sustained stress indices are. Don Edwards was the guy from ConocoPhillips that wrote the B31 3 chapter 320. Uh, that's me, Chuck Beck sits on B313 and drives a lot of this work through. Willie works for me and Mark works for Chuck. So these are the two guys that did all the work and our names are at the top. But basically it's to define the sustained stress indices. <clears throat> Additional work in, uh, you know, Hans said that this was sort of an interactive group. So if anybody wants to ask questions about the changes in the I factors and the fatigue design for a metallic pipe, we can talk about that too because that was a, a very contentious issue in the B31 codes, right? Back in 2007, a colleague of ours, uh, Chris Hennett, said that the piping slope was off because Chris was a vessel guy. So he said the slope for all the fatigue curves for the piping components was in error and that we should be using the vessel slopes. Well, the piping guys didn't think that was a good idea, so Chris said, I'll run tests and show you. So Chris ran a whole series of tests, and sure enough, the piping components that he tested followed the vessel slopes. So that was a pretty pretty big deal. And then the question became, well, how does that affect stress intensification factors for piping? How does it affect high cycle work? Well, the answer is, is it sort of affects uh, stress intensification factor work, but we've made adjustments to the procedures so that it doesn't matter. In the high cycle work, it has a big impact also, but most piping engineers don't deal above 200 to 300,000 cycles. If you deal above 200 to 300,000 cycles, you generally don't use the guidelines in B313. If you do, there's a new appendix that's being put in B313 called Appendix W for high cycle work, which follows the guidelines that Chris has and that uh, Section 8 Division 2 has for welded fatigue curves. So the high cycle work for B31 will follow every other document in the world. Low cycle work only affects SIFs, and there's guidelines for SIF tests that impact that. And the rest of the ranges, the two curves cross and so the curves are close, close enough where we're actually working, so it doesn't matter which curve you use. Yeah, so that all worked out pretty well. Here are the two different, uh, this is the original Markle slope definition, so this is 6n to the minus 0.2, so this is the, the Markle F multiplier for allowables. This is the Hennett multiplier for allowables too. So the, the Hennett curve essentially produced a different multiplier for the allowables for the B31 codes. And as it turns out, this slope is pretty much the same thing as this slope. And these things cross at a point where it just doesn't make that much difference for piping. There was a huge deal with B, uh, welded T's because welded T's, as we started uh, measuring their thickness for the 0702 project, we found that some manufacturers were providing welded T's that were thinner than the matching pipe. And that just wasn't, that was not expected. They were thinner than the matching pipe and still stamped B169, which is all that's required to be used in a nuclear power plant or in a refinery or any place. All you need to do is stamp it B169. So manufacturers were getting around the rules by providing really thin tees for, uh, in particular, exotic materials. 
Okay, so we went out and tested these and said, yeah, the T's definitely don't satisfy the burst test requirements, so there's definitely a problem. But the B16-9 standard was okay. So there's been discussions about that. Sure. Okay, this is the thing that started uh, all of the, the controversy, so to speak. This was Note 11 in B313. Note 11 said the out-of-plane stress intensification factor for reducing branch connections with the D over D ratio between 0.5 and 1 may be non-conservative. So the piping code says you're not conservative. And it also says that selection of the appropriate SIFT is your responsibility. So people say, well, why doesn't Caesar fix this or why doesn't the code fix this? Well, the code recognizes it's non-conservative and put these rules in and says, you've got to make sure that you get the right answers. Yeah. So, I mean, it's your responsibility, not the codes, to make sure that all the different components that you use in your piping system, that you're picking the right sieves. Yeah. Too many people, I think, rely on Caesar to do that, and that's not Intergraph's job. And really, that's not the code committee's job, because they don't know all the exotic materials and all the different <coughs> things you use for piping components. But for the majority of the standard piping components, there's a huge set of mistakes, and we can correct those. The nuclear codes already corrected them, like we said, and so we're correcting them in the B31 codes. So here's a listing of the, the, the problems. When uh, D over D is between 0.5 and 1, the, the stress intensification factor is off by 2 there. It can easily be off by 2. I'll show you that test data. Of course, what's the safety factor for fatigue? Safety factor for fatigue is two. So if the SIF is off by two and the safety factor is off by two, that's probably not a good thing. The T over T ratio. The T over T ratio was included in the code in 1961 with the effective section modulus calculation. So the effective section modulus essentially multiplies the I factor by the ratio of T over T for reduced branch connections. And what happens is any T over T ratio that you've got in your system if, it's 0.5, if the branch is 0.5 inches and the run is 1 inch, the T over T ratio, of course, is 0.5. So you multiply the SIF by that and reduce the stress by half. And so what happened was with additional tests that we did, we found that, and Ev, recomm Ev Rotobal recommended this in 1960. He said, wait a minute, the T over T ratio shouldn't be used for all T over T ranges. But they just didn't have any test data to tell where the, the, the cutoff should be. So yeah, I mean, as we did more finite element work and ran tests, we found that for certain of the components, the T over T should be limited to 0.85. So as you continue to use lower and lower T over Ts, you're continuing to get less and less conservative results. Of course, one of the mistakes that Markle made in the original 1960s work that they did, 50s and 60s, is they got the in-plane and the out-of-plane uh, stress intensification factors on the run switch. So Ev said, as a minimum, the code should switch the in-plane and the out-of-plane run stress intensification factors. He pointed out several errors where the, the SIFs are off by eight or nine times in an overly conservative way. And that's whenever the D over D ratio is less than 0.5, the SIFs on the run pipe are calculated, of course the in-plane and the out-of-plane are switched, but the SIFs on the run pipe are calculated as if it's a size-on-size -size component. So for a 20-inch uh, run pipe going through a a refinery or a gas plant that's half inch wall, the stress intensification factor is going to be eight or so for this small branch, and it's going to be eight for stresses on the side wall of the pipe where there's no stress concentration factor, where there's no stress intensification. So folks now that are designing these using B313 standards are essentially multiplying the stress by eight times when they shouldn't be, and then rerouting the run pipe for stresses that are 10% of the allowable which is, of course, silly. So there, there's that problem. And there's a variety of other independent problems when you start evaluating the capital I factors. Of course, in 2010, the code changed the, uh, the sustained stress indices to capital I, made most of them equal to 0.75 I or 1. And so if these guys are in error, the little i's are in error, then the big guys are in error also that are dependent on the little i's. So all of these things uh, come together. We're correcting the little eyes, and what we're going to talk about today is how we're correcting the big eyes. So this is what uh, some of the, the wording from WRC 329. The first one at the top is code requirements are obviously silly. This is where Ev's talking about the stress intensification factors on the run pipe. So he says code requirements are obviously silly when the D over D ratio is less than 0.5. 
The piping analyst should use his judgment and ignore the code rules, is basically what Ed's saying there. He's saying when you ignore flexibilities, your calculated moments, for his example, can be off by about nine times. So if the moments are off by nine times, the stress calculation is off by nine times. This is where he says that being off by a factor of two is not that big a deal when you're off by eight or nine times in other places. Here's where he talks about the, the R over T has got a single exponent in the code. He says we don't know what the exponent should be. So given certain exponents, in some cases it can be 25 instead of 11, but we don't know. Okay, well, recognizing these things, we did a lot more uh, work with finite elements and tests, and we think we've got these sorts of things sorted out. And you'll see a variety of exponents on, uh, on run SIFs in the new code equations. Right. That's how you turn it off. Okay, this is torsion. Ev said that torsion was one of the worst errors that's made in the code right now. So he cites one example where the torsional error is 2.7 and another one where it's 12. So our torsional stress intensification factors are errors in B31.3, well, 31.3, 4, and 8 now are on the order of 12 in some cases. People say, well, the SIFs are all, have got to be good because they're based on tests. Well, here's all the test data. So we went to all the committee members, got all of their test data. The uh, Naval Research Center had run some tests, so we got all of their data. This is D over T across the top and D over D down the bottom. So D over D 0 to 1, D over T 0 to 100. That's the parameter range for the code where you see yellow blocks. That's where there were tests run. So there's a lot of tests run in the low D over T range because that's where the nuclear code does all of its work. Here's the higher D over T range. There's a single test here. This was a 4-inch pipe that, that uh, Markle ran. He didn't have 4-inch pipe. He couldn't buy 4-inch pipe in that D over T ratio. So I bought a standard wall 4-inch pipe and then bored it out. And that was their standard test. He wrote in his, uh, his test uh, notes that, well, we didn't get the boring centered. You know, the, the center was off, but we're going to test it anyway. So the, the testing that they did there, because he wasn't so confident in the tests, those were the ones that he ran at the lowest cycle lives. So these tests, they, they, they uh, span from 250 cycles to failure to about 1,200 cycles to failure. So that is an incredibly low cycle range to get a good stress intensification factor. The new stress intensification, guide, stress intensification factor guidelines tell you do not run stress intensification factor tests below 5,000 cycles to failure because the scatter is too big, because there's too much plastic deformation in the test, and you just don't get a good number. So all of the tests that we've got for high D over T branch connections were done in a cycle range that we would never accept today on pipe that was bored out and wasn't center bored properly. So this data is bad. So essentially we have no data for high D over T ranges for tests where the T over T ratio is between 0 and 1, most of our tests, or most of our fittings. But we do use long weld necks. We use HB uh, fittings for uh, branches in large diameter pipe. So let's look at the tests where T over T is between 1 and greater than 1. Okay, there's no tests in that range. So there's really very little fatigue test data out there for a lot of what we're doing. So people say, oh, run finite element calculations. Well, what we're finding is that there are folks that say uh, finite element calculations, at least elastic finite element calculations, in this range are too conservative. And so the few burst tests we've ran and the few uh, uh, fatigue tests we've run tend to verify that. So if you just you say, oh, let's just run finite elements. Finite elements is perfect. So we run an elastic finite element analysis. Well, for fatigue prediction, out in the higher D over T range, it just tends to be too high. The results are, the stress identification factors are too high. So those things have to be derated. Less building, if you look at Section 8, Division 2, Part 4, there's a new area replacement rules for pressure design in the ASME code. Those, those calculations are based on elastic stress analysis. And as soon as he gets to a high D over T, D over D ratio, he derates the elastic stress analysis. So basically what he does is he runs an elastic finite element calculation, which is what he did to get his correlations, calculates the membrane stress, the maximum membrane stress, and then for the worst cases of D over T and D over D, he divides it by two and then compares it to the allowable. So he derates the elastic analysis by two before he compares it to the, the, uh, the allowables. 
some big derating factors. And he dropped the derating from what was recommended. So you can imagine, whew, you know, can I count on the elastic analysis? Well, it's going to be conservative, but perhaps by a bunch. Here's the T over T problem. So folks thought as this T over T dropped that the stress would always drop. But what happens is it drops, and then there's a, a hump in the curve, and then it continues to drop. So there needs to be cutoffs in T over T also. So what you see in the new equations is you see cubic relationships for T over T to simulate that effect. So you'll see that in the new equations. Here's a let's. This is what started the D over D issue. And here's the test data. So here are the SIFs that you're using now. I mean, this is straight out of B313. Here's the test data. The blue di diamonds are the test data. Here's the new correlation equations. So these are the new recommended equations. And you can see that the separation is about two times. So that's, there's the verification that says that Note 11 of B313 that says that your calculations are non-conservative. The magnitude is about two times. Here's the, uh, the new recommended equations. This is the format that it takes, so flexibility and stress intensification factors. There's a new set of diagrams that hopefully help people understand what's the difference between an OLET and an HB fitting or a long weld neck. So there's, there's more detail to the figures. The bend equations are more or less the same. Here's the new equations for uh, pad reinforced intersections. So you can see that the, the intersections equations now are a lot more complicated. So the, the top six expressions are for K factors, so flexibility factors. So every branch connection has a flexibility factor. And here's all the stress intensification factors. So there's three SIFs for the runs and three SIFs for the branch. So these are the new stress intensification factors that should show up in B31J. Unreinforced fabricated T's. Here's the T over T ratio limits, right? So all those things show up in the code. Here's the uh, D over D to the third power. So there's the hump in the D over D curve. So all these things are aspects now of the new equations. Okay, so that we've got these new I factor equations. Can we go back to our sustained stress analysis and use 0.75I times M over Z and let that be less than SH? That's the question that we want to answer now because that's why we're here today is to talk about the sustained stress evaluation. Okay, this is what shows up in B313 now in uh, 2010. So in B313 2010, these equations and these variables started showing up. These capital I's, these sustained stress indices. And the only definition of these was in the where Don defined the I equals and then told you what to use. This is the only place where there's a definition of them in B313. So II, for example, is a sustained in-plane moment index. In absence of more applicable data, use 0.75 I or 1. He redefined the term, but then didn't provide any additional information about it. So this went in in 2010, and people weren't sure what to do. So the question is, is we've got 0.75 I, we've got this I, we're told to use more applicable data if we have it. Uh, we're 0.75 I we can use. Uh, what's the right thing to do? That's the question. Do we use the I factors from the new 0702? Is that more applicable data? What should you do today? All right, so first we have to have a definition of what's the sustained stress index. And the nuclear people always uh, got after the B31 people because they never had a definition. We never had a definition for what was 0.75 R. Okay, well, that's what this paper was for. Don wrote the first paper on it when he released the uh, equations in 2010. This gives the uh, description of the test procedure. And in B31J, Appendix F is the test procedure. Yeah. So there's sufficient definition now for what is the I factor. And what you're trying to use is a failure mechanism in B313. It's based on work from the nuclear code. The nuclear code was always very clear. Starting with uh, B31-7 uh, in 1967, they described what was intended to be done with sustained stress analysis. And sustained stress analysis is a lower bound limit study, or a collapse evaluation, or gross distortion. All right, those are the things that we're trying to protect when we're doing, we're trying to guard against when we do a B31 analysis. Yeah. So lower bound limit studies. The lower bound limit study requirement in section three is the twice elastic slope test. So the TES, or twice elastic slope test, 
is the basis for what we're using as a criteria. Here is the B31-7 from 1967 talking about, back in that period, straight pipe, what's the limit load or collapse load under combinations of loads. I mean, that's where all of this comes from. So here's B31J. So now you've got definitions in B31J, Appendix F, and Appendix H is for K-factor tests. There's a whole new definition for K-factor tests. Okay, so what exactly is it? So we've seen it. SSI, we've seen that term used. We've seen sustained stress or sustained moment index. Some of you that are familiar with nuclear CB2, you see 0.75i, and you see capital I. I'm going to maintain that they are all more or less the same. They all give you the same ratio. Now, there's folks in the code committees that would argue with that all day long. But I think when you sit down, I think in five years they'll all agree that these are the same things, I think. So let's first define collapse as a twice elastic slope because I think for some of you that are B313 guys or EN13480 guys, the twice elastic slope test is not familiar to you. Next, we'll define what's the intended safety factor, and then lastly, we'll define the SSI so that you know how to get it. Okay, here's the twice elastic slope test. So you take a pipe that's mounted to a, uh, the back of a, a weld neck flange, you apply a load on it, you measure the displacement somewhere close to the load, <coughs> doesn't have to be where the load is. Doesn't have, it can't be here, clearly, because there's no displacement. But somewhere along the pipe where the load's not affecting the utilization, you measure the displacement. You can measure the strain. So that, that's one of the key attributes of the twice elastic slope test. It's very interesting in that it's a very durable test. Put a load on, measure displacement, you're going to get a result. So you put the load on, you measure the displacement. Of course, as we know, that uh, metal geometry is elastic, 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 elastic until globally it begins to deviate from linearity. It's not when it hits yield, it's going to hit yield somewhere down here, right? Peak stress will hit yield somewhere down here. But the global behavior begins to deviate. I only went right at the, at the knee of the curve. So the global behavior begins to deviate, and the failure occurs at this point, at the point where this is considered the elastic slope. So when the twice the elastic slope crosses the load deflection diagram. That's the definition. That's the limit. That point is the limit of the twice elastic slope. It's also termed the twice elastic displacement because that makes more sense. What this is, if you think about the uh, tangents, is that in reality, this is the point where the actual displacement is twice the elastic displacement. So the failure mechanism <clears throat> is where the measured displacement, where the actual displacement in the piping system is twice what you measure with Caesar or ROAR2, or autopipe, or any elastic analysis. Right? So that's the point where they want you to stop. For low D over T ranges, this corresponds to about 2% plastic strain. For high D over T ranges, it corresponds to about 10% of plastic strain, which is a lot of plastic strain. But that's the definition of the test. Okay, now let's talk about desired safety. What's the safety? What's the separation? from the twice elastic slope failure criteria that the code wants you to have. Let's take collapse. Let's, let's, let's say that, and this, this equation tends to give you the twice elastic slope moment for straight pipe within 10%. So this is the collapse moment for straight pipe is the diameter squared times the thickness times the yield strength. That's just a pretty good number for carbon steel straight pipe within plus or minus 10% when the D over T ratio is up to 100. So this gives us the collapse moment. So that's the twice elastic slope moment. The allowable from the code for a straight pipe where the I factor is 1, essentially M over Z is equal to SH. SH for collapse is taken as 2 thirds SY. So from this equation, we can calculate the allowable moment. So the allowable moment is 2 thirds SY times Z, right, or, or this, where Z is pi over 4 D squared T. Right? So now what we can do is we can take the collapse moment divided by the allowable moment, cancel out all of the stuff that's common, and find that the that ratio is about 2. So that's what sets our safety factor for B31 uh, sustained stress criteria. We want the collapse moment divided by the allowable moment to be about 2 for anything, intersections, elbows, anything. So there's the definition of the safety or the, the collapse ratio or the failure ratios. 
Okay, so this is it. I mean, that's the number. The collapse moment over the allowable moment should be two, where the collapse moment is defined by the twice, twice elastic slope. So has anybody seen that before? I mean, I'm, I would argue you've never seen that before in B31.3, or 31.1, or 4, or 5, or 8, or 7, or 12, or 9, right? I mean, you've probably never seen that in EN 13.480, because the definition doesn't exist. But that was always the intent. So now we're going to be, okay, this is going to be harped on more and more. And the difference you can imagine is the problem is, is people thought that they could calculate sustained stresses, that it's a stress, that it's a value that you can find from a finite element program. And I think you can see from this that's not the case. All it is is a value multiplied by some constants to give you a relationship to a lower bound limit study, right? A limit estimate. It's just a, a measure of how close you're coming to collapse. It's not a real stress. The code committees have had trouble with guys sending finite element results and saying, why don't you match my finite element results? Well, they shouldn't. There's no elastic <coughs> finite element prediction that's going to give you this stress. You know, this is predicting collapse moments. So the, the code has started redefining the stress. You'll start seeing the word effective stress. So it already shows up in B31.1, and they're trying to put it in B31.3 so that people don't go out and run finite element analyses and then say, here's my stress, why doesn't the code match it? Because the code is a, an effective stress. Yeah. So if, it gets, if that gets through the code committees, you'll see the, the terminology effective stress show up in B313. Okay, so now what's the I factor? What's the SSI, the capital I, the B2? <coughs> what, how do we want to define that? So we start by saying what we want is we want the collapse moment over the allowable moment to be two. That's, that's what we want to insist. So when we make that happen, we know that we've got this capital I times the allowable divided by the section modulus is our allowable for anything, an intersection, a bend, or straight pipe. For straight pipe, I is one. So we're going to define I as the collapse moment of straight pipe divided by the collapse moment of the part. Now that's a wonderful and it's a simple equation. And that tells you exactly what capital I should be. And you know that the collapse moment of straight pipe is d squared TSY within 10% for uh, d over T0 to 100. So this you know. Now all you've got to do to calculate I is find the collapse moment of the part. And that's it. And you plug it into that equation and then use it forever in, uh, in the B313 code analysis. For Caesar, this number is typed directly into the new stress intensification factor screens for Caesar version 7. In the older version of Caesar, you don't have it, but now you have it. When the world is in alignment, this is equal to 0.75i. Most of the time it's not. So if we take this and plug it in for i, that goes here. Allowable over z, that's here equals two-thirds SY. Two-thirds SY, as we saw before, was the collapse moment for straight pipe divided by two. Well, the stress for the collapse moment of straight pipe divided by two. It's our allowable is half of the allowable for uh, collapse of straight pipe, right? So now if you take that and cancel these, <coughs> move this up to the top, you see that the allowable moment in the part divided by the section modulus is the collapse moment in the part divided by two times the section modulus which is exactly what we want. So that's for th this is how I is defined for that reason, to create that relationship. Okay, so there's how you move it around, okay. So let's, well, I mean, you, you don't need to see that. Okay, so let's use this definition for bends. Okay, so for bends, we know what our I is. The collapse moment of, of a bend has been developed. There's expressions for those things that have been developed by a number of researchers. So a relatively good one is it was developed by Gupta, by a fellow by the name of Gupta. And what he gave us was d squared TSY, which is interesting because that's the collapse moment for straight pipe. When researchers de uh, describe these things, basically what they do is create functions that give you the collapse of the thing you're interested in relative to straight pipe. And that's exactly what Gupta did. H here in this equation is TR over R squared. That's the flexibility characteristic from B31.3 and 1 and 5 and 8. We know the collapse moment for straight pipe, so we can find the sustained stress index or the B2 or the I factor for bends 
by taking the ratio that we saw before, collapse for straight pipe over collapse for bends, it's just this number. So now you've got a pretty good correlation for capital I factors for bends. That's more applicable data. When B313 says use 0.75i or more applicable data, this is more applicable data. Because it's based on something that's real. 0.75i is a guess from uh, a few tests in the low D over T range. So for bends, basically what happens is this is the equation that you're using in B313. That's the I factor that you type into Caesar. If you don't type it in, Caesar assumes 0.75i. And this is what you should type in. Or if you're really interested in collapse, that's what you should type in because you get a more realistic result. Let's look at where the, the results aren't realistic. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. So here's some test data. Or here's a test point, and here's Gupta's curves. Now let's plot, just, I mean, let's, let's, if you don't mind, I, I mean, is my English okay? Yeah. Is it too fast or too slow? So, so it's I mean, fast, but we uh, keep up. Okay, so just keep going and get, all right. So because it, this is sort of an interesting curve, I think, is, is there is a big argument about what do you do with bends. And some people say it's 0.75i, it's 0.75i, and have zero background for it. But I think now we have background for it. So what we want to look at is we want to look at the collapse over the allowable. So the collapse moment divided by the allowable moment, where the allowable moment, right, is I M over Z equals 2 thirds SY. And the allowable, that M, the I factor there, is based on either 0.75i or i or, well, we're not even going to use Gupta's value because we're going to use Gupta's expression for collapse. So if you use Gupta's expression for collapse and use the m allowable as 0.75i, as folks want to do, so collapse over the allowable moment should be 2, right? If Gupta's right through the full d over t range of interest, then what this curve should look like, if 0.75i is what we should use, is it should be constant at 2. And it's not. So if you're using 0.75i today and Gupta's right, this is the curve you're following. And what happens when you get to d over t of 100? Your collapse moment, your allowable moment, is equal a little bit, but in fact it's lower than your collapse moment. No, wait, I said that wrong. The allowable moment's a little bit over the collapse moment at D over T of 100. Now, fortunately, most, most of us don't run piping systems with D over T's that big, but some of us do. Here's a test data point that we just got finished producing. And this is something that we're recommending, is we think that you should, as a minimum, not use 0.75i for bends, but if you're going to do anything, at least use i times m over z for bends for sustained loads. Don't use 0.75i. What's the nuclear code use? The nuclear code uses 1.3 over h to the 2 thirds for their value of B2. Well, what's ours? Ours is 0.9 over h to the 2 thirds. Right. So the nuclear code at least multiplies it by 1.44. So the nuclear code equation look, looks here. So you can see they're well above, well above 2. And interestingly enough, these are some other researchers. And the difference between the top lines and the bottom lines is the top researchers used elastic perfectly plastic without large rotation. And Gupta used elastic perfectly plastic with large rotation. That's the only difference, which is a little bit interesting. <clears throat> All right, so let's reproduce or just emphasize what we just talked about. The allowable moment is a half, half the collapse moment. So that's what you should see if you're at 100% of the allowable. The SSI, or the sustained stress index, is the collapse of straight pipe over the collapse of the part. When the twice elastic slope moment or the collapse moment is applied to a piping system, the system should be overloaded by 200%. So if you're at 200% of the allowable, you're right at the twice elastic slope moment. So if you've got a test, and the test gave you a value for the twice elastic slope, you should be able to put that into Caesar and see double the, uh, double the allowable. So you're at 200% of the allowable. That's an indication that the software is doing what you expect it to do. All right, so let's run a sustained stress check. 
and see what Rodeball said about intersections. Intersections are a lot more complicated than elbows. So what we're going to do is let's think, Rodeball said that the biggest error in the V313 code that we're using today is based on torsional stress intensification factors. Because the torsional I that we use today is 1. Okay, so if the torsional I factor that we use is 1, well, let's see. Okay, if this is 1, the 0.75 I is still going to be 1. So the torsional allowable is going to be given to us from this equation. So I can calculate the allowable on a branch in a T, for example, by saying the allowable is going to be equal to the hot allowable or 2 thirds SY times the section modulus of pipe. So, okay. And I expect, like for bends, that the problem is going to be worse in the high D over T range. So we took this, this pipe and we make these out of tube because we can get high D over T ranges in tubes. So this is a 6 inch diameter tube with an 0625 wall. We have a, a very highly specialized welder come in and uh, do very precise TIG welding. Uh, people have asked us, because weld qualification is a dicey item, how do we make sure that our welders are highly qualified? It's a function of the number of tattoos they have. <laughs> Lots of tattoos, highly qualified. Okay, so this is the test. So what we were doing is we knew what the allowable moment was. Right? We could calculate the allowable moment. And so we wanted to continue to apply bending moments, torsional bending moments, to the branch. And then we, when we collapsed it, because it's a collapse test, right? When we collapsed it, we wanted to see how far the collapse moment was under the allowable moment, or over the allowable moment, right? Because the collapse should be over the allowable moment. Okay, so here's the result of the test. So there's the B313 allowable moment for torsion on the branch based on 2 thirds SY from the MTRs times the section modules. And there's the maximum moment capacity in the test for D over T in 93. Now what's that tell you? Is that good or bad? That's bad. Right? So, yeah, like Ev said, using an I factor of 1 for an unreinforced branch connection for D over T in 93, doesn't give us any capacity at all when we're at 100% of the allowable. Okay, so let's try to, to think through what we did, and let's see if we could predict what the I factor, what should the capital I factor be for this test? Does, every, does anybody know right off of hand, would, would, would somebody say, oh, well, that's, can you look at this and, and tell us what should the capital I factor really be for this intersection? All right, let's think through the definitions. We said that the capital I factor should give us a, an allowable moment that's half of the maximum capacity. Right? We said that that's, that's a fixed definition. So if the maximum capacity is at 1,200, this is what the allowable moment should be. The allowable moment should be the ratio of what's I equal to 1 to I equal to what we have. So this was for B313 today where I is 1 for torsion. So the, the SSI or the B2 factor or the uh, sustained stress index should be the ratio between here and here. So the, def the ratio between here and here is 2. So that's a little bit further. So the ratio should probably be about 2.2, 2.1. That's what the sustained stress index should be for that branch connection. So now we can answer some interesting questions. So here it is. Okay, so this is what we just talked about. So the eyes, the... the quantitative value is 2.26. So now we can answer the question, is it, can you use 0.75i for this using the new i factors? Okay, well, let's, I'd like to show you how that works. Okay. And we'll see. So what I'd like to do is, is we've got that D over T branch connection, and I'd like to see if the i factor, the capital I of 2.2, is what we get if we use 0.75i, right? That's the question, because that's what started all this in the first place. So I'm going to start a brand new super tool that everybody should have. It's called FEA Tools. It goes with Caesar. And I'm going to see if I can show it to you. So this is, this is the FEA tools. It does a lot of wonderful things. Uh, what I want to look at is the SSI and the SIF calculator because it calculates SSIs for you. And what FEA tools does is it calculates what we think are better SSIs, calculates the better SIFs. Then it also calculates the better SSIs 
based on correlations with all the collapse data that we found. Okay, so here's the basic spreadsheet. So I want to put in that intersection that we just tested. So it's 6 inch because it's tube. It's 0.0625. That was size on size. Okay, I press compute. Okay, so these are the SIFs. These are the SIFs that you're using now. So there's no torsional stress intensification factor. That was the nature of the problem that we just saw. The torsional stress intensification factor should be 9.8 according to 0702, according to the new correlation. So with, uh, so we saw that the value should be about 2.2. So what we're saying is the question we, we were asked to, to answer was should 9.87 times 0.75 is that 2? Well, no, that's 7.4. So the sustained stress index you'd use if you were following code guidance and 0.75i would be 7.4 as a capital I instead of 2.2 because the I factor is high. And that's completely wrong. So instead of if you've got the collapse here, half the collapse here, you'd be designing down here. So that's another gross error. We can't, uh, the, the uh, sustained stress indices aren't proportional to the stress intensification factors. Okay, so this, this is a validation of that. This is a straightaway validation of that. Some of the other things that are interesting here is, these are the K factors. These are new K factors that are in the code. So if you have a D over T branch connection and an unreinforced T, in the out-of-plane direction, you've got 46 extra diameters of pipe concentrated at the branch connection in the out-of-plane direction. So what happens is if you've got an extra 20 diameters or so of pipe attached to the branch and you're not including flexibilities, then you're ignoring at least two-thirds of the overall flexibility of the system. So your moments could easily be three or four or five or six times overestimated. And that's why, that's how Ev showed that nine factor in figure uh, 15 of uh, WRC 3, uh, 329. So 46, 23 in the torsional direction. These are interesting numbers. The uh, torsion through the run, we've got 20 extra diameters of pipe just in torsion through the run because we cut a big hole out of the run pipe and put a branch on it and then the branch, the, the resistance to torsion is in bending, which is very weak. So we've got 20 extra diameters in the run just in twisting. So one of the things that we found with these larger D over T intersections is that uh, the torsional flexibilities get high. Well, if the torsional flexibility gets high, the torsional SIF gets high too. The two of them go up together, but not proportionally. What this screen does is it shows you the new equations versus B313 versus the nuclear code. So this is supposedly updated from WRC 329. Dinorsky Veritas, <coughs> EPRI. These are the EPRI results. Here's WRC 497, so it gives you all the correlation equations that are published that we could find in the United States that were applicable to piping components, and it compares them for it. So what you would do is you would run this when you got ready to run Caesar, especially if you had a high D over T branch connection, or if you had an OLET or any smaller uh, uh, branch fitting and wanted to see if the D over D ratio effects were killing you. So you'd come here and you'd run this and you'd compare what you're doing in Caesar or auto pipe or any pipe stress program to what the new recommendations are or what the nuclear recommendations are or what EPRI's recommendations are. And if these and these and these and those agree and they disagree with these, then that's probably wrong. And that's what happened. B313 and, and its approaches are the oldest of the correlation approaches we have today. But that's what we're still using. The next thing that's interesting here is there's a sustained stress index calculation. So if we go ask for the sustained stress index calculation, what this shows us is it shows us using the B313 I factor approaches is should we use 0.75 I or should we use I raised to a power? Because that's the relationship between little i and capital I. Capital I is equal to I raised to a power. And then the question is what's that power? And the version of B31J recommends a maximum size for that power and the maximum uh, M, uh, uh, size, magnitude of that, that exponent is 0 0.5. So you get a better estimate if the capital I factors are equal to the, the stress intensification factor raised to the 0.5 power. 
That's a much better estimate than I equals 0.75i. Much better estimate. So, B313, well, let's not even look at that because that's not going to help us very much. So here's what, because we don't have torsion, right? We're interested in torsion. So the torsion ones, we do have those from the STLLC projects. So torsion for our unreinforced T, 3.1. So what you would get if you ran this in Caesar is in the Caesar torsional capital I form for the intersection, you'd see the value 3.1 which is pretty darn close to 2.2. It's a whole lot closer than 7.4, and it's a whole lot closer to the right number than 1, which is what you're using now. So if you have that problem, this protects you today. 0.75i, well, we just saw what that was, 7.4. 0.75i is not a very good idea to use, and capital I equals I to the 0.5, where you've got the right I factor is probably the best best guidance to follow for branch connections. So, we know what the SSI is for straight pipe, we know what the SSI is for bends, from Gupta, and you've got a great correlation for the SSI for branch connections. Can you pass the hat around, Hans? <laughs> I mean, I think that's, that's valuable. I mean, that's, that's very useful. Let's do something that's kind of fun. Let's say that we've got a 24-inch, half-inch wall. Let's say we've got a 6.625 by 322 branch. Something that everybody uses every day in metallic pipe. I'm going to use that and I'm going to calculate the stress intensification factors. So let's see what happens. 3.7 and 4 for in-plane and out-of-plane on the branch, 5.7 and 7 for in-plane and out-of-plane on the run. So we already know that these are switched because the out-of-plane should be the highest, or the in-plane should be the highest, right? Because that's the one where the branch is at the top. Yeah, these are, I mean, these are just switched in magnitude. But we've got a 6-inch branch on a 24-inch header, and we're putting a 7.4 multiplication factor on the side for moments that are, whose highest values are, that's completely wrong. That's what Ev wrote a ball called silly. This is the silly that you're using today. Right now, in, in, if you run Caesar or Autopipe or any, any program. So what's the, the recommendation for it? Instead of 7.4, the recommendation is 1. You don't have to intensify that. How can we get away with 1? We can get away with 1 because 1's for a girth butt weld. Almost never do you put branch connections at girth butt welds. You know, you don't cut a hole in the pipe and weld a, a, a branch on a girth butt weld in a run pipe. So we're already intensifying the one is already an intensification of two. So in general, you've got parent metal on the sidewall. That could really be 0.5 would probably be more accurate for that number, for torsion, for that number. Okay, what does everybody else say? Nuclear code says 2.1 because it can't go any lower than any of the other ones, right? The nuclear codes like B311, so torsion, out of plane, and in plane all have to be this equal to the maximum one. So this isn't a good indication, but it's definitely lower than uh, 7.38. Mm. So what is Donorsky Veritas? They don't say anything about the run. <clears throat> Waste says one. So Waste agrees with 0702. Why dare doesn't give any values for the run. So the, the three entities that give better data say that that number is way too high. So most people would say that you are definitely not using more applicable data. If you run B313 and don't put in a stress intensification factor that's less than 7.4. Some people would also say that you're just being conservative. And some people would say that you're being wasteful. So if you, reroute, if you reroute a piping system because of that number, that's what Ev would call just being silly. Yeah. And as you run B313 today, there's of course no flexibility. So for an unreinforced T, you'd be leaving out 19 extra diameters of pipe. That's like leaving out 19 diameters of straight pipe attached to the run. So FEA tools and 0702 makes those corrections and inserts them into the Caesar model automatically for you. 
I'll show you uh, how that works a little bit at the end if we have any extra time. So let's go back here. Okay, okay, we did that. The uh, it's interesting. There's torsional uh, moments about the branch, and there's torsional moments about the run. They're both about the same in terms of how bad they are. This is a very interesting plot. So we've. Uh, of course, we're running a lot of tests in Houston with this. So these are the tests that I just showed you for the 6 by 0625 size on size. We uh, put design pressure in. As soon as you put design pressure in that T and rerun the test, you can see the number you get. <clears throat> so with design pressure, it's almost safe. But without design pressure, it's below the allowable. The failure mechanisms are unique and different. Without any pressure in it, of course, the... Uh, the top part of the run collapses over top of the bottom part of the run. I mean, you could put your hand in under here. For the uh, pressurized test, what happened was nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. The, the, the pipe looked like a sausage as we were bending it. And then all of a sudden on the compression side, we saw a little, little convolution form. So the material just formed a convolution, and that was it. And then the load level dropped, so we couldn't put any more load on it. So we had to stop the test. I've got a high-speed animation of the test. Do you want to see what it looks like? Okay, so here's the, just the lab where we're doing the test. There's a piece. Okay, here's, here's all set up. So there's, you can see the rollers. So we're rolling the applying the bending moment over here and rolling it inside. That's Rich A. So Rich is measuring the load. There's the sort of the device that keeps the moment arm constant. So this is the high speed. No, that's the, that's the final collapse state. So here's the high speed animation of it. So this, this actually occurred over about 45 minutes to an hour. So what you're watching, we're just slowly applying the load. Here's a dial indicator. So what's happening here is every time that spins around, there's an ovalization of a tenth of an inch that's developing on the dial gauge. So as we twist it, you can see how the top portion is just folding over on the bottom portion, and it's the, the fold is just working its way down the run pipe. So that's, that's exactly what the unpressurized tests look like. They just collapse right on themselves. And of course, what the pressurized is everything stays a cylinder. It doesn't, uh, doesn't double over on itself at all. And that's D over T of 91. That's not even D over T of 100. Okay, so we've answered this question. There's the, this is sort of the summary. There's the point 0.5. I to the point 0.5, there's one eye for bends, and you know how bad that is. You know, even one eye gets bad for high D over T. So if you, if you need to, you can use Gupta instead. Let's talk for just a second about including pressure, because this is interesting. The, uh, the B31 codes want to back away from pressure. The, uh, the first part of the B31 code that included pressure as part of the code equation methodology was B31.3 with appendix P. Write in appendix P for the IA factors and FA in appendix P and B313. It explicitly said to include pressure in the fatigue calculations. That was the first time we had a quantifi quantifiable equation style for calculating uh, uh, pressure fatigue. This is the equation 9 in the nuclear code. So here's their pressure in index, uh, PD over 2T, their uh, moment index, essentially the same as ours, M over Z less than 1.5 S. So the thing that's of interest is what is B1? This is for bends. Let's look at what B1 is for bends. So here's the equation for B1 for bends. Sort of an interesting expression because it's got a constant that has a negative number in it. So what you can do is you can move this to the other side and solve for the point where the B1 factor goes to zero. 
So what happens is what they're saying is that for sustained loads of load evaluations in the nuclear code, there's a point where pressure does not take away from the load capacity, right? which is what we just saw with that intersection test. And that happens when D over T is 24. <coughs> now, we don't have these correlations for intersections yet, but I expect that this is what you'll see for intersections shortly, is some kind of correlation for this, because it's a shame to take pressure and multiply pressure and then reduce the allowable moment for a component, for a stress component that's really making the intersection stronger. The nuclear code takes, a, takes into consideration that for bends, at least they don't take away, you know, they don't let pressure penalize you. And with everything else, we let pressure penalize us. So what's, uh, if we think about what happens in the uh, uh, B313, what's some, some poor guy that's trying to interpolate there or interpret this on his own? So a poor guy that's trying to interpret this on his own using the 2012 version of B313, he's going to say, do I need to use pressure? Yes. He thinks he does because he looks at Appendix P and it says to explicitly include it. So for expansion, he's going to use it. For sustain, he's going to use it. Because if you go to the sustained stre sustain stress equation, it says include pressure. So now he's got essentially <coughs> this equation. So he's got the pressure term, but he doesn't know what to use. So he sees this IA, he looks in the appendix P of uh, B313 in the 2012 version, and he sees that IA, little IA, is equal to little IO. Little IO is a big number. You know, we've just seen little IOs of 7, 11. <coughs> so he looks at big IA, and he sees that big IA says, well, in lieu of more applicable data, use big IA of 1. So he says, holy cow, should I use a big IA? I've got a little IA of 11 and a big IA of 1. Is that right? So then he runs a finite element calculation and finds that the number's pretty reasonable. It's a pretty big number. So then he does stick 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 in there for pressure, you know, based on an elastic calculation. Or he even uses the out-of-plane capital I, which is 0.75 IO, which is a big number. So the guy that, that's not sure what he's doing and trying to figure this out without some basic guidance, without at least these definitions I was in, would definitely go down the wrong street. So what did B313 do in 2014 to solve that problem? They got rid of Appendix P. So Appendix P isn't in 2014 version anymore. So now there's almost no guidance for what to do with, with these terms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is just a discussion of, of that problem. So here's SA, this is capital I A F A. FA says longitudinal force due to sustained loads, pressure and weight. So you've got to find a capital I A, and capital I A is in the absence of more directly applicable data, make it one, even though little I A is a big number. So it's difficult, I think, to try to figure this out. Here's the new set of equations. I don't think this is surprising to anybody. I mean, this is the new things that you see in B313 are the torsional SIFs, which hadn't been in there, little ones and big ones, and the little IAs and the big IAs. Of course, you can imagine that before we only had these, really, and now we've got two more stress intensification factors that the, the real B31 user doesn't know what their values are. So for little D over Ts, it doesn't matter, but for big D over Ts, you can imagine some of your colleagues are going to wrestle with this, I would imagine, because their values can be wildly off. They'll either be over-conservative or under-conservative. You'd have to be throwing a dart blindfolded and accidentally hit the bullseye to get the right number, right? because there's just not much guidance in the industry. There's some great papers on this. Uh, Vernon Matson, uh, Dr. Matson, I think at Ohio State, has done a lot of work on this. So there's, there's a lot of documentation out there for Section 3 but you have to go to Section 3 to get it. You won't find it in any of the B313 documentation, except for what I showed you. This is what the SIF and the SSI test <coughs> look like in the low, low D over T, low D over D ranges. Separating them by 0.75 is not bad. But in the high lambda ranges, where lambda is D over T to the 1 half times D over D, in the high lambda ranges, the separation is just too big. You can't use 0.75 I out there. People say, why should I change the number? Well, in 10 places, every place that B313 defines a, a little i or a big i, 
it says only use the value that's in the code in a little more applicable data. So, I mean, how many times do they have to tell you before you go use more applicable data? Yeah. So this is FEA Tools. Uh, it does a lot of interesting things. So one of them is it makes all of the corrections for the SIFs and the Ks and the SSIs. It makes the corrections to the best that we know them today and puts them in Caesar version 7 because Caesar version 7 is the first version of Caesar that has all the SIF slots. Before you had four SIF slots for run and the branch and that was it. Now you've got 16 for the run and the branch. The little eyes and the big eyes for the run and the branch. Four of each of those. And FEA Tools fills them all in. FEA Tools version 3 does some interesting things, but I think the biggest thing from just a push the button point of view is there are problems with bends today that we know about. And the, the biggest change for bends in the news code equations are, is that, or is that the uh, flexibility characteristic for bends, for all bends, is 1.65 over H. That's in the B31.1 code, that's in the B31.3 code, 4, 5, 8, is 1.65 over H. That's the flexibility characteristic for bends. That's for 180 degree return bends. For 90 degree bends, the flexibility characteristic is 1.3 over H. 20% or so different. So the, new, the, the 0702 and the new recommendations in B31J say, gee, we use a lot of 90 degree bends. We should probably be using the flexibility characteristic <coughs> for 90 degree bends. So it says for 90s, use 1.3 over H. So what you'll see is all your bends stiffen up a little bit. For 45s, it's 1.1 over H. But there's no, re no recommendation for that because the, the feeling was that just changing the 90 degree bends was too, uh, too difficult. The bend stress intensification factors are only to be used when the bend is exactly the same wall thickness as the matching pipe. The reason is, is the assumption for bend deformation is that the bend ovalizes along its entire length. So if the attached pipe, you've got to have enough straight attached pipe so that it ovalizes e evenly with it. Otherwise, you produce a, a concentration at the bend straight pipe intersection that isn't included in the current code. So as soon as you use differing T over T ratios between the bend and the straight pipe, all bets are off with the current SIPs. Okay, we know that. We've known about it for years. It's something that's easy to correct. It's got to be corrected analytically because there's no correlation equations for it. And that's what we do with FEA Tools version 3. Here's the equation. Here are the K factors. Where are these from? The nuclear code. Code case N219-2. It says, why are we using the wrong K factors? How easy is FEA Tools to use? You start it, you find the job, and you press the green convert button. And that's it. It produces comparisons of displacements, reaction loads, and stresses. Can I show you some, a few comparisons for two or three minutes? I mean, this is not a commercial process. But it's, it's two or three minutes. I mean, this is educational. So this was kind of an interesting job because So what you do is you uh, you make the you make the uh, the conversion of the Caesar model. So you press convert, you get a new Caesar model. Then you run a new Caesar model. So what we do is we run a variety of models because we like to be able to compare different things that happen. We put loops in some of them. Some of them we don't even bother com uh, running the uh, the translation tools. Some of them we leave exactly as they are and just move supports around. So we can compare up to ten different files together. So here what we see is we had an overstress condition with the top, uh, the world of design. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and put the FEA models in it. So let's go ahead and run FEA for all the branch connections and put in the proper flexibilities and SIFs and SSIs. So that's the comparison of the first two. So I wanted to see if that would help me. So I come in and I do the, the comparison. So here's the comparison. So there's the displacement. So you can see that the flexibilities in the system 
definitely adjust the displacements in some places, which is what you'd expect. This is exactly what you see is certain parts of the system, there's absolutely no change because flexibilities don't have an impact if the pipe is long and there's elbows. It's only when the system's tight, you know, where you've got an effective length of pipe that's proportional to the effective length of pipe in the intersection that you see any change. So right here we see changes, here we see changes. That's areas where there are intersections and the pipe is short that's attached to the intersection. So what's on the left is as you coded it, this is biggest to smallest. So the biggest difference is 16,000 foot-pounds to 8,000 foot-pounds. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. That's forces and moments. Here are the displacements. So the displacements are pretty close. I thought that first plot was displacements. It's not. The first one was forces and moments. So it shows displacements. Here's reaction load differences. So it shows differences in uh, support reactions, support moments. Forces moments in the pipe, then the big ones are code stresses. So here's the code stress differences. Now it's interesting, there's a difference, but not enough to make a, uh, not enough to impact the model, not enough to get us under the allowable. You can see we'd have to be pretty close to the allowable here before that, that would help us. And we're about 200% over. So there's another code comparison. So what it's, it's interesting what it does, there's correlated and uncorrelated. The correlated is when you've got uh, exactly the same elements from job to job. If you put a loop in, for example, the loop isn't the same from job to job. So you want everything else compared and then the loop compared separately. So this is all the separate stuff. And even all the separate stuff, the stresses are still about the same. So that didn't help us very much. So the thing that ended up helping us was we came down and we put in a contoured fitting where we were overstressed and we used the FEA. So when we did that, these were the results we got. So the displacements, still not very much. Reaction loads, a little bit. Moments, well, I'm getting closer to two. There's forces and moments, 16 to seven. There's the stresses that are the same, still not very much for stresses that are the same. And there's the uncorrelated results. So we're getting over a two times drop in the stress magnitude. So this, this was an effective, uh, an effective exercise for us. So that's, that's how the software works. If you want to do a, a comparison, what I've got here is this is a pump system. So what I want to do is this is the original Caesar model. So I can get, ask for the correlation, then it writes it to this file. If I ask for an FEA comparison or translation, it writes it to this file. So this will be a new file, a new Caesar file that I read in and run. All the load cases are there. So I press the green convert button. Are you sure you want to overwrite it? Yes. It goes out, it reads in the Caesar model. There's four pumps, two vessel connections here, and seven intersections. So it, it read in all those intersections, replaced them all with finite element models, ran the finite element calculation, wrote out the SIFs and flexibilities. And it did that in three seconds. How did we do that in three seconds? How did we run six finite element models in three seconds of branch connection? They're stored in a library. Once you run them once, it stores them. You never have to run them again. So if you've got standard wall 10 inch pipe, you only run that once in your life. It's a little different than that. But I mean, you don't run them very often. So you run your, your, your model once, everything's stored in a library, then it's just over and over and over again as you go through the design process, they're, uh, they're reused. So you say, okay, the model's there, you run it in Caesar. The interesting thing about this is it gives you some interesting text output. What it does is it prints tables of the branch SIFs, run SIFs, and the SSIs. Where are the SSIs? SIFs. There are no SSIs here. Okay, I, I did something wrong. I set this model up wrong. Normally, you get another table here of SSI comparisons. But it compares the FEA to the 0702 correlations to B31 for the run, for the branch, and then these are the stiffnesses. And generally, you would get SSIs. Okay. I think that's it. So thank you for your time and attention and coming. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.